What is going on everybody man? King Recon here and this morning I decided to do a very trollish Star Wars parody for Hunter x Hunter and I was going to upload it but I said you know what I don't want to get a copyright strike <laughs> because I've already gone through that and I've already had a channel deleted so I said I'm not gonna do that. So I decided to just come on here and give my thoughts on the Dark Continent arc thus far in Hunter x Hunter man. And it's been quite an arc thus far, guys. It's hard to believe, you know, whenever I went back and I started reading it, that we've already been in this arc for 20 chapters. But while rereading and while going through the arc again, I gained an, a brand new appreciation for an arc I already love. And that arc is the election arc. Now, the election arc is my third favorite arc in Hunter x Hunter. And for multiple reasons. But there's one reason in particular to where I'm very, very grateful to the election arc for having happened before this arc. And I think I understand why Togashi decided to have the election arc happen before this arc in terms of tone, in terms of the narrative shift, and, and of where he did, he's wanted to take this story from here on out. So the tone from the, elect, from, from the Chimera Ant arc to the election arc was a massive change. And... In the election arc, we got used to this sort of new tone and the way the story is being told right now. The way that a, some of the characters that we're used to seeing on a regular basis, like Gon and Killua, have taken more of a uh, or taking more of a backseat. Even though Killua was a big part of the election arc, Gon was not until the very end. So you know, we were used to having our primary characters be Jing, a Pariston, uh, and then for a while they're Killua, Hisoka, Illumi, and whatnot. But I really, really like the tone shift that arc rep rep represented as well from a dialogue standpoint. The dialogue in the election arc, even though Hunter x Hunter has always been filled with this dialogue that makes you think, and the characters have like these long expositions uh, and, and long uh, monologues to where they can go on for a long time. Is this thing too bright? Hold on, let me push it down. But yeah, where they go on for a long time talking about what, whatever, the, whatever it is that they're going on about. The election arc really took that to the next to the next level there was a lot of exposition a lot of dialogue and you really had to pay attention in order to find out exactly what was going on especially in the manga so i really 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 admired that and i really loved how togashi did that in this arc because the, uh, it served as a great transition in tone shift to what we're getting now in the dark continent there's a lot of dialogue in the dark continent and there's a lot of very, very important dialogue that we're getting in the dark continent but we it would have been out of place had the election arc not had happened before. Because the election arc proved, just as the Heavens Arena did, that we needed a transitional arc like that before we got to uh, the current arc. And that, that was too dark, man. And, and before we got into this, this current arc, that, uh, that we needed that tone shift in order for this arc to or at least the beginning of the arc, to still feel, you know, to still have the same sort of feel the election arc has, but still feel very, very different. And I really, really do appreciate that when it comes to setting the tone and not making everything just feel out of the thing. Because with, with Hunter x Hunter, and with every single arc feeling very, very different from one another, even though there is threads that connect them to one another, there is no arc that is like the other. You could literally sit down and watch one of the arcs, in one sitting and get a full grasp of what is going on. You know, of course, you would still need to watch the entire series in order to get like an emotional investment, emotional impact, and whatnot. But each arc is like its own story, in of it, in of itself. Uh, besides, maybe the the Zoldic family arc, because that was so small. But the other, the main arcs, uh, most certainly, you can watch those as their own entities and and have them as their own entities. And that's something I've always loved about Hunter x Hunter. But it is is the unpre unpredictable storytelling of it. But when it comes to the Dark Continent arc this far, I'll never forget whenever I first read the manga and I caught up to chapter 340, I was so interested in Beyond Natero, man. But as this arc has progressed, I have begun, I, I've, I'm even more interested than before. This man is allowing himself to be captured. He is allowing himself to be captured in order to get to the Dark Continent and then his plans will continue going because... Beyond Netero at this point is like the Irwin and Kisuke Urahara of this series. And that's saying something. Because Hunter x Hunter is filled with guys that you never know their full motivations or intentions. From the very beginning of the story, we've had characters like that in Hisoka. 
in Naruto to a certain extent, uh, Krollo, uh, Jing, Periston, a couple of the Zodiacs. But the main one that really gets to me is Beyond, because at least we get dialogue and we see Periston and Jing on a regular basis. Periston had his own arc in the election arc, so we know more about them, but there's still a lot that we don't know, and there's still a lot of motivations that we don't know, and thus makes them extremely interesting characters. But when it comes to Beyond Natero, when, when you get introduced as Netero's son, and then we find out that Netero released all these videotapes telling them everything about Beyond, um, like everything warning them about this guy. And what makes me so interested in Beyond is the fact that this man has gone, but he wants to go back, but he couldn't go back. He was restricted to go back until Netero died. And that added an entirely new aspect to Beyond. You're just sitting here and you're like, did Be did Beyond, like, was he the one that brought the Chimera Ants? Or, or like, they caused that, that calamity to come to bring the Chimera Ants because he knew that Netero would want to stop them. And thus, you know, the, their journey, their, it would, you know, start the turn in the wheel into which they could actually go back to the Dark Continent. Or Beyond himself would want to go back to the Dark Continent. And and thus he, he was the one that put that plan into motion because with Beyond, it seems like he's the type of guy that would risk it all and leave everything behind to achieve what he wants to achieve. He has that side of, of Netero to him. And, and I really, really respect that about him, but the way that he's going about it now, after that, where he states and he tells Cheadle that he wants to be a prisoner, you know, he wants to be taken over there as a prisoner. And, you know, from the moment he sits down, he's like, because she asks him, she, she's basically sitting here and she's like, you know you're gonna be in prison for a while, man. Don't you want to prepare yourself? And this man just stretches like like, like he's about to go on on a freaking on a 400 mile dash or a 400 yard dash here, man. And he's stretching. He's like, Nah, I'm good. Like I'm like, bro, how long have you had this plan? Because no matter what they brought up, it, whether it was the hair, the blood sample, anything, he said, take it. It's yours for the taking. I have nothing to hide. I have nothing to hide. You guys are the ones with everything to lose. I have nothing to lose. You know, we can go on this dark continent. We can go on this journey. We're gonna, we're gonna get on this ride. We will make it there. I will take you there. And Beyond is such an interesting character because for, for everything I just, I just mentioned, but there's so much mystery till to him, man. Like, why and for what reason? Because we remember how whenever uh, Netro was talking about how there's two different types of strengths that you have to uh, be worried about here, especially when you go to the Dark Continent. There's a strength in wanting to prove yourself in a one-on-one -on -one battle and in a versus match, you know, proving yourself in, 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 a, in a battle of warriors, I like to call, like in a, in a battle against another individual to test how strong you are against another strong person. Hence, you know, like Merrim versus Netro. But when it comes to the Dark Continent, there are the atmosphere and the very continent itself is your enemy. So that is that, that proves to be an entirely new and, and different strength and be and beyond knows this. Because Beyond has been there before. So that that adds just an entirely different thing to what he wants to do when he gets there. So I'm very excited and very interested in, in the whole Beyond scenario and Beyond Netero himself and as a character. Every time we get to see him and just see a couple more glimpses of him and how, how he's just chilling, man. We'll see him on his bed. He's just laying down like that. He's just waiting, man. He's waiting for the perfect time to strike and that's what makes him so interesting. That is what makes him so interesting and I can't wait to see some more from Beyond. So heading on uh, aside from Beyond, of course, the stuff going down with the Zodiacs and how they, 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 they basically, you know, had, uh, have... Leo, Rio, and Kropika coming in uh, to to fill up the spots that Jing and Periston uh, left behind. I like the dynamics that they've had with Leo, Rio. I love the dynamics that they've had with Kropika because no one trusts him, but he doesn't trust them. But he's like he's more like using them. But the relationship that him and Miz I have it seems like these guys have always been together, and it's it's kind of weird. Even like in the latest chapter, him and Miz I, they have like this sort of of connection that is that is very very hard to, to 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 describe because it's not like they're friends but they need each other for their certain goals and thus this relationship was born but for everything these two always go to each other without revealing too much and yet they both know each other's abilities 
So that in of itself should give you like this type of friendship type of thing. But I've, I've been one to never trust Mizai. I don't trust Mizai. I've never trusted Mizai. When they first um, re revealed like the traitor of who like the traitor could be, I said Mizai saw him at first because I've never, from the very first moment that I saw him in the election arc, I've never been able to trust this guy. I don't trust any of the Zodiacs. But but when it comes to me, well, except for Jinx, because Jinx's my boy, but, you know, and, and Paris, and because it's it's different because with the with the other Zodiacs, since they haven't done anything and since the, the way that they are, you can't trust them. But since you know Paris is going to be up to no good, just off of that alone, you can trust them. And, like, it's it's kind of hard to explain because we know that Periston is going to do something. We just know it's going to happen. So because of that, it'll be easy to trust him but not trust him. Like, it's, it's kind of weird. With Periston, you know what you're getting. With Jin, you know what you're getting. But with the other ones, I'm not sure because we haven't been as exposed to them and we don't know what their motivations are. I, 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 I mean... It's, it's kind of hard to explain, man, but just know that I would rather be with Parison and Jing than with any, the, with any of the other Zodiacs because you never know, especially in this type of situation. So with that in mind, Mizai's the one that I trust the least out of all of them. I, out of all of them, and it's always been like that. So I find it to be really, really cool how Togashi has had him uh, be like the main source of of how the Zodiacs feel because you know he even tells Kuropika at certain points like we we felt like this we've just been trying to find this traitor this entire time of course we find out who the traitor actually was but you know even even beyond that like it seems like Mizai was always like the, the, the spokesperson to Kuropika about how the Zodiacs actually felt he was the guy that represented him and um and it's it's pretty cool how Togashi is using him and Karapika in that relationship in order to, to move uh, the plot forward. But just know that, man. I still don't trust Mizai, and it'll take you. It'll take me a long time to ever trust uh, any of the Zodiacs. There's just something about them all, man. There's there's something about them all. Besides Parison and Jing, like I said before. Because with Parison, you know what you're getting, and you know that, that something is about to go down. So you can never fully trust the guy. But And, and then with Jing, that's me, so I trust myself when it comes to that aspect. But yeah, man, it's actually staying on the topic of, of, of Parison and Jing, man. Yo, what is wrong with this camera today, bro? Is it because of the sun, man? Is it not used to having this much sunlight coming in? But, um, and I apologize for, let me, let me, let me just move the damn thing over here, man. Let me move it over here, turn it down. That looks better. But yeah, with, uh, with, with, with Periston and, and Jing, let's move over to, to those side of things, man. With these two guys have, like, being together... And we actually getting to see them in a scenario to where it's just them two and it's not any more of the Zodiacs. What is going on with this camera today, bro? With, uh, with, with just these two and none of the other Zodiacs. So after they left and now with the with the personalities and the relationship, because Jing and Parison's relationship has always interested me, because I feel like they find, they, they see themselves as equals. Like, Parison even states, like, maybe it's because he has the same mindset that I do. And maybe that's why I hate him so much. And the fact that Jing is the only person that this man has ever hated, it makes me so excited to see what Paris is gonna do here in the near future. And everything from the moment that Jing first got there, up until up until um the very last time where, where we saw them, where basically, Pariston told uh, Jing, he was like, no, you take care of this, man. You want to be the leader? Fine. I'll sit back and I'll watch how you will take care of things. And I love their entire uh, back and forth, man, because they have a relationship like no other relationship in the story. And what I mean by that is, is these guys are always one step ahead of each other. However, they never want to reveal too much. Like, I love that one specific part, I believe in chapter 344, where Pariston did this entire thing, this entire debacle with with with, with these guys that came in as as actors for of, of a sort that basically said, you know, you who do you think you are, man, coming up in here and being our leader, you know, basically telling that to to, to Jing and supposedly to Parison as well. Jing saw throughout the entire thing, but what I loved about that uh, scenario where him and Parison were by themselves against these guys was whenever Jing went up to him and he was about to reveal one of his net abilities. Uh, or, well, we thought it was one of the abilities, but in reality, it's just his natural talent, and it's a mimic thing that I'm pretty sure I'll, if, if you master your net hard enough, you'll be able to, every, anybody will be able to do it. But when it comes to Pariston, he looks over there, and he's like, are you sure that you want me to see this? And Jing's like, yeah, that's cool, it's fine. Because Jing will never reveal anything to, or, or too much 
of it, you know? And same thing with Parasite. Like, they're always hiding so much of, from each other, but they're always showing each other. Like, it's, it's a weird thing, but I love their dynamic. I, I love their relationship dynamic. And I love how every single time that Jing does something, we get, like, an inner monologue of, of how uh, Parasite is feeling inside of his head. And it gets more and more, uh, like, just more Parasite, like, as it goes on. It goes away from what... Uh, how, how do I put this? Normally, we see Parasite as a guy that's always in control. And he's always like, hey, we see the smile, we see the spark. But when we actually go into, into Periston's mind and we see what he's actually thinking of how much he hates this guy. And, you know, from the very, very beginning, from the first time we went into his mind and he stated that happiness usually comes from those that love, from those people that love you. But for Periston, it's those that hate him. And that's what fuels his happiness from then up until the very end where, where, where he's like looking forward and he's curious to see how Jing's going to take care of the entire scenario. I just, I love their dynamic, man. It's it's so fun. It's you never know what you're gonna get out of it because you're always always they it, Jing always knows what he's got to do to piss off Pariston. It's it's just it's amazing, and I love how Pariston is just doing all of these things to try to get back at Jing, and it's I love it. I it's it's so cool. But with their entire scenario and and the characters that we've been introducing in their portion, they've all been pretty cool as well, man. The Don Freaks thing, of course, you know, with him being the one in the in the Dark Continent all the way up in there for 300 years, and he's still writing that damn book. Because Jing presented those three reasons, you know, but we all know it has to be the third. He still has to be writing that book. He wrote the West, but now he has to write the East, man. And, yo, I am hyped, bro. I am hyped for the day that when it comes that we meet Don Freaks, bro. My boy has been writing a book in the Dark Continent of all places. He has been writing a book in the dark content. My boy has to be a top tier, man. He has to be a beast. So, oh, I'm excited for that, man. Like, that, that is that is going to be one of the best, uh, like, or, or not one of the best, but one of the things I'm looking forward to the most is going to be whatever Jing eventually meets Don Freaks. And what does that name mean? Like, the Freaks lineage. Like, who is he in terms of, uh, of, of in, in Jing's... Um, ancestor family family tree who is he to jing and do the freaks come from here or, or, or you know what, what what is it you know i want to find out more about their family when it comes to uh, the freaks family and well, so that's going to be very very exciting and i can't wait to see the dawn man and the fact that this man is writing a book out there bro it just it gets me even more hyped to see him so yeah i've, I've loved this shift in having so much primary focus on jing and on Paris, because I love those characters so much, and uh, and, and just seeing how they're like taking a primary role and, and going on their side of the dark continent is so cool, and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more from that. Speaking of the freaks, though, I want to talk about Gon right quick. When it comes to Gon, you know, last time that we saw him, we saw that he went back with Aunt Mito, and now he is supposedly, you know, there was a joke in there how he's going to write 30 volumes about his life, because at the time, that's, or still, that's how many Hunter Hunter volumes there are, we're at 33. But at the time of that being done, it was like 32 volumes of Hunter Hunter had been out. So it was pretty cool. It's like, yeah, man, go go ahead and write the story of Hunter Hunter, man. And then come back whenever, uh, <laughs> we'll come back whenever you're ready. So, but he can't feel his Nen. You know, he can't, he can't feel his aura. And I love, there was one particular portion in there that I absolutely loved. And I don't remember if I touched upon it. I can't look back on it now because it's on the old channel. And that old channel's deleted. But there was one particular portion that I've always loved about that. And it's whenever Gohan is talking about the greatness of Jing. And it's not just because I'm a Jing fanboy, but it's because of out of respect for his for his father and out of respect for 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 another human being. I found it to be so cool because Gon states himself. He he says, you know, I found this dude and I met him, but then I started questioning. You know, I, I had already achieved my goal, but now what? You know, now what, what's what's next for me after that? You know, the fact that he questions himself. Like that is something, something so Gon like, because Gon has always been that type of character. Not only that, but he always presents those what if type of scenarios to not only himself but to those around him. He tells Aunt Mito that he wishes he would have had his Nen, because he would have absolutely loved to have felt Jing's Nen and his greatness in the flesh. Like he would have loved to feel like that, that emanating presence of greatness coming from Jing. And I never thought about that until he brought it up. Because initially, I was like, you know, he met Jing, man. Like, he, he, he met the goat. But he may have met him. But he never actually got to feel his Nen because he can't feel it anymore. 
And I really think about that entirely new dynamic of when he meets Jing again, he's gonna have that to look forward to. He's gonna, he's gonna have that, he's gonna, he has like another goal that he could already have in his mind. I want to see Jing's greatness in the flesh. I want to see how amazing of a guy he actually is. Because I never got to feel his Nen. And when I saw that panel, I knew immediately that Togashi has something more planned for that. And Togashi, I mean, he's the GOAT, but when I saw that, and I saw that, it, when Gon stated that, I was like, dude, he has something planned for, for Gon having another goal centered around Jing again. And I would love that. I really, really would. Now, the question remains, you know, when and how will he get his aura back? Because he's, he's going to have to get it back, man. He's going. So... The theories and the assumptions are is that whenever he comes back, he's going to be a specialist. If, 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 if that is to be the case, I have no idea. But that is what is being speculated, and I am, I am on board that. I really do believe that as well. Will he still do the Judge Anken? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> we'll have to see, man. But just like Jing told him on the phone, he gave up everything that he had, all of his talent, all of his potential, everything that he had, in order to take out P2. So he should be happy with the fact that he's still alive. And I agree with what Jing states. So if we don't get going for a while, I still believe that maybe later on the Dark Continent arc, depending on how long this arc goes, we will get going and kill us. Maybe heading over to the Dark Continent. I actually have like a future video topic that I want to talk about. That I talked about this on stream a long time ago with a couple of other friends. That um, we were talking about the Dark Continent and what's, what the aftermath of this arc is going to be. But I wanted to save that for a separate video. Uh, it's it's it, it is a pretty interesting topic, and I would actually love to have a, a couple other people on to talk about what the aftermath of the Dark Continent arc would be. But regardless of that, that is where Gon stands here, and I don't think we're gonna get more from Gon for quite some time. I think now the primary focus is on Beyond Netero, Kurapika, the uh, Krolo, Hisoka, you know, the whole Phantom Troop situation there, the princes, um, and Jing and Periston. So we, we've already had like our primary cast that's going to be going over to the Dark Continent, which is going to be cool because it's going to be fresh and it's going to be nice. And once again, I love how Togashi started off with that tone shift all the way back in the election arc with Gon shifting out as a main character, introducing all these other characters that would take place as our primary characters until Gon comes back into the main story. So now we head on into my personal favorite part of the arc this far. And this is this, this is a lot coming from me because I'm a, I'm a Jing fanboy. I love everything that has to do with the man. I love everything about the story, about the way that he is, and everything that's dynamic with Paris and everything. But I love the troop, and I love their story. The reason why Kurapika is even on my favorite character's list to begin with, because Kurapika himself, you take away the troop thing, he's nothing. I, I, like, I, I have no interest in the guy. Well, I, I do have so, sort of a little bit of interest, but when, when you combine him and the storyline with the Kurta clan and the troop, which make, makes up his character in himself anyway, but... It really makes me so interested in the story around Kurapika. Because he himself is not that interesting. But I love the story behind and everything that goes into uh, his plot. Like the princess, man. I'm super, super stoked to seeing what's about to happen here with the princess, bro. Like, God, man, the fourth prince. Let me tell you something right now. The four princes you have to keep an eye on are the first prince in Benjamin, the fourth prince, um, Harkenberg, and um, Wobel. Those are the four you have to keep that you have to keep an eye on because those are the four that have been uh, showcased the most. I think the prince that is with uh, uh, Melody is going to get wrecked. I see that being the first one to get stomped just because of the way that she acts. I see her getting <laughs> destroyed. Uh, here in the, next, in the next couple chapters, I really, really do, and maybe even by one of the troops. We'll see. We'll see what happens there. But with the whole prince dynamic, the whole succession war, I find that to be so interesting because it's gonna it's gonna give us a brand. There's a lot of things that I find interesting about it. The fact that these guys are having a tournament on a boat to for who is gonna be king, like that by itself is already an interesting concept. It is it is a survival of the fittest on a boat to the dark continent. It's that way we're getting an entire thing for two months. These guys have to worry about surviving before they even get to the Dark Continent. The Dark Continent itself is something that is out of this world, man. 0.04% survival rate. And yet, they're more, they're more worried about of who's going to be king. By damn it, you might not even live! 14 princes. It is an all-out survival game here. And I love that aspect. 
And on top of that, bro, which is what gets you on this arc. On top of that, you have the troop. You have Hisoka hunting the troop. You have Krolo coming in here trying to get a to get some treasured valuables. You have Kurapika on here who wants his Kurta eyes back. If he runs into the troop, he's going ham. Like, bro, it's just all these things coming in beyond this summer on here. And he's chilling. He's, he has his legs up, man. He's chilling. So this boat ride is insane, man. But getting back into the princes. The other thing that I'm really, really excited for from the front, from the from that's with the princess, man, is the guardian sacred beasts. Like, I'm so excited for the potential of the guardian sacred beasts. This is something brand new to us, folks. And the fact that they're able to learn so quickly because it's a paris, it's a, it's a parasite jar ceremony. And we got to see in chapter 360, like, the, the insane amount of creations Togashi could do with this thing. I'm interested in the potential and what the all of their separate sacred beasts can do so i can't wait for this uh, whole stuff seeing the brand new net abilities with the guardian spirit with the guardian um sacred beasts it's gonna be fun man it's gonna be a blast I, i'm a huge fan of jojo so just having something similar to stands and i know how that sogashi was also inspired by by jojo so seeing how he handles this whole guardian spirit concept is going to be flipping awesome sauce man i can't wait to see what they all look like how they're going to engage in battle against each other one of my favorite things about the last couple of chapters before I get into the whole Hisoka and Krolo and troop stuff, one of my, one of my, one of my favorite things about the uh, about the final part of the chapters, like 358, 359, 360, was how the bodyguards themselves feel like they're in a game of chess. Like, they can't reveal too much information to each other. To each other. I feel like this is something that other mangakas or other storytellers, maybe even myself, would have overlooked into which these bodyguards can't even trust each other because you never know how one bodyguard could have been killed and been switched out with a bodyguard from somewhere else to, to, to guard their prince. But this is my thing. These bodyguards understand that they themselves are just there as ploys, as props, because in reality, this thing is going to be fought by the princes themselves. And it adds just a layer on top of a layer on top of a layer. By God, like they understand they're just there as props. They're, they're, they're just there as, 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 as like, yeah, I'll, I'll be a bodyguard. But in actuality, what are they going to do when a sacred beast rolls up on them, bro? What are they going to do? And I love that aspect, man. Like, there's, they understand. They understand that this game is much more than just in a simple, you know, if you hold them up on me, I'll shoot you. No, there's much more than that, man. If there's deaths happening to nearby comrades, that could have been something that was protecting the prince, that was, you know, you, let's just say if I was one of the bodyguards, and one of the other bodyguards got killed, I would be questioning whether it was an enemy attack, or an ally trying to protect our prince, or an ally trying, try, try, trying to pre prevent a scenario from happening even further. You're like, by the gods! Like, like you have to have, these bodyguards have to have so much more through their minds. They can't trust anybody. Period. Period and simple. And I've always loved about Hunter Hunter. I've always loved about Hunter Hunter. From the very moment York New City started and it presented that concept of um with with all of the bodyguards of the Nostrade family, uh, and how they can't reveal too much and they can't this is only a job. They can't reveal too much each other about each other. They they have to take upon this with, with like a very, very professional and how they could die at any moment. Don't ever reveal too much information about yourself, like that type of thing, man. And I love how Kropika asks, asks, asks us a civil question, like, you guys know about Nen? And almost all of them say no. But then afterwards, we find out that all of them actually do know about it, because if they if they find out they actually know about Nen, that put them in danger, or that would put them in a different scenario, or that would put them in a different situation. Like, it's crazy how even fodder individuals like that, like these bodyguards, have so much thought and so much that... that uh, you know, protection. Like, they, they feel like if I don't do something, I'm going to die. Like, just off the bat. And that just raises a sense of danger for this entire arc, man. I love it. But I love how they are self-aware and they are aware. Everyone. All the bodyguards. You know, you can include Biscuit. I love how Biscuit's in there, by the way. Biscuit and, and seeing Basho and some of these other guys. Again, a Melody. I've always loved Melody's design and her, the whole concept behind her character. But... Uh, and of course Hanzo as well, but you know, aside from that, you know, with these regular bodyguards, they understand that this battle is about to be, is about to take place between the princes themselves. And that to me provides an entirely, 
new and interesting uh, story and just that in itself. Like, how is that, how is that dynamic going to work? These bodyguards are there, but what are they going to do when my man Benjamin pulls up in the cut on the fourth prison just start throwing ads? What are you going to do, bro? So I love that, man. I really, really do love that. So I can't wait to see what is about to happen here in the, just the next few chapters, man. It was already interesting enough before we left where Karatika just... Ah, I'm excited. I'm excited. I can't wait for the next chapter. But, you know, this entire boat ride is, is going to be insane, man. It, it truly is. It truly... Like, the, 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 whoever survives this, this boat by itself is already considered a top tier in my eyes, bro. Whoever does, man, because by the gods, by the heavens, man. But going back into Isoko and Krolo, man, and, you know, that entire fight, I loved it so much. Not just because it was Isoko and Krolo going at it, man. But I loved how Togashi, once again, I, I love how he does so many things subtly to prepare for the future. Krolo and Hisoka, that battle until the last chapter, the last half, chapter and a half, half of the last chapter of, 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 of the chapter before, he's presenting nonstop what Krolo's abilities are. You know, what, what abilities he has and what abilities he can have. And, you know, all of this brand new abilities that Krolo has taken. And at first, you take that as, okay, Krolo is doing this in order to have Hisoka absorb so much information that he will end up be getting confused because there'll be so many different scenarios in his head he won't know which one to pick. And that by itself is an amazing battle is an amazing, is an amazing battle strategy. Krolo is what Shinji Hiraku is. Not Shinji just tells an ability like an idiot. Krolo does it to confuse his enemies and make them want to choose between A through D. And then you'll have to choose if you pick C, it was actually B, and you get it wrong, you get killed. Krolo's genius like that. And Krolo, that's what I love so much about Skill Hunter and Krolo as a character, because he presents the he has all of these you know, m moves and all of these skills, but he knows how to make you pick and, be, and make it look like it's one, but in actuality it's the other. And that by itself presents an interesting battle dynamic. But not only that, not only was Togashi doing it there, I think Togashi revealed all of Krolo's abilities there as well, so that way whenever Krolo starts moving here, in this arc, he won't have to reinstate uh, what his nan abilities do. And I feel like that's going to be very, very important whenever it comes down to a mystery figure or a certain individual moving down on the underground that, for example, even like the, something as simple as the forged tickets, we know that's the Phantom Troop, bro, getting onto the ship. So I love how Togashi introduced all of Krolo's abilities, or not all of them, most of them, or at least some of them, there. So that way whenever we see them again and we start seeing some in instances of them again, he doesn't have to re-explain these abilities once again. So I feel like that's a very, very important... Uh, aspect of that Hisoka versus Krolo fight that we're going to appreciate more whenever we get more into the Dark Continent arc. But Hisoka versus Krolo in itself is just an awesome battle, man. Uh, it was, you know, constantly layers upon layers upon layers outsmarting each other and absolutely loved it, man. But chapter 357 is one of the most insane chapters in the entire series of Hunter x Hunter. I truly cannot tell you, I mean, the reactions left on the channel, but I cannot tell you the, the amount of shock and how I felt. Because I love the troops so much. I really, really do. But when Hisoka took out Kortopi and Shalmark, I had like this feeling in my body where I could only explain as like a hunter hunter feeling. Because you're like, I love these characters so much, but I'm so excited for the future, bro. Like, I can't help it, man. Like, it saddens me, excuse me. And it saddens me, man, because I love them, man. I, I, we weren't able to learn much about Kortopi. And Shal Shalnark was an awesome character, but when Hisoka took him out, I was like, bro, the plan is setting into motion. Now, it's Hisoka's hunting the troop. So if the troop are going after Hisoka, and then as well, that this is this is what this boat ride, bro. I, I don't understand, man. So let's connect the plot. Let's connect the points here. Krolo is heading. Krolo believes he killed Hisoka. At least I believe he does. He, he is going towards ship to get treasure. And he believes the other troop members will be there. What about when he finds out that Kortopi and Shalnark are no longer there? Machi is still trapped back there. So we, then we have the dynamic of Krolo enters ship, going for treasure, believes the other troop will follow him. Some of, some of the other troop, I don't know if Hisoka is going to kill the other troop members on the boat or outside of the boat. I believe that... Kortopi and Shalnark will be the other ones he kills outside of the boat, the other ones he will kill on the boat. Or at least he will try to kill on the boat. 
So then we have that dynamic. Hisoka still ch still, still ch uh, chasing after the other troop members. Hisoka chasing troop. Thus leads him to getting on ship. Kropika going after princes. Princes on here going uh, su succession war. Kropika wants the fourth prince because he has a set of the, of, of the, of the Kurta clan eyes. Since they're all in the same boat, they're all going to um, end up meeting each other one way or another. There's one particular scenario, and I've been saying this since I first cut off to Hunter Hunter, and I've been actually been before that, after York New City. I stated how one of the most hype moments in the entire series, maybe the moment I'm looking forward to the most, in terms of right now, and what I'm looking forward to from a storytelling standpoint of how I can tell it's going to be extremely insane and unpredictable and hype, is going to be the chapter where Krollo and Kurapika come face to face again. Because I don't know how, what's going to happen this time. Because now, Hisoka's the hunter. Hisoka's going after the troop. And if he starts killing more troop members, we know how emotional Krollo gets whenever one of his members die. One of them died. Uvo died, and he had an entire requiem for him. What is he going to do when, if multiple of these members get killed, bro? What is he going to do then? And what about before he makes the decision, he runs into Garapika? That's going to be an interesting scenario, bro. I, I don't know, man. Garapika's going to be mad. He's, gonna, he's this is Krollo. This is, the, this is the leader of the troop. That's an, that's an, oh my God, bro. But the Dark Continent arc thus far has been absolutely fantastic. And I, it's just, it's just starting, bro. It's just set up. It's just set up, man. Now is the time. And like, even the boat right up in its end of itself. Like, like we're not even there. It's the Dark Continent yet, man. And so much is going to happen here on the boat ride itself. Whoever survives the boat ride, man, I like, who's going to survive? That's, that, that's, that's a question you ask, ask yourself. Who's going to survive this boat ride? And it's like, bro. Like, if it turns out to where it's the fourth prince and Prince Wobble are the last two. Man, bro, it's going it's gonna, to gonna keep more and more intense because if they're, if they're the last two. And they're constantly trying to get each other. But then while Kuropika is trying to get the fourth prince, he, run into, he runs into Krolo. Or he sees Krolo's dead body in the hands of Isoka. Or vice versa. Or whatever the case would be. Like, I don't know, bro. So many possibilities and beyond, man. Jig and Ferris. And you're just like, what is going on? So, I'm excited, man. I can't wait. I just wanted to come on here and talk about how I felt about the arc this far. And how much I've been loving it, man. And this reread I did just recently really, really helped me uh, love, love and appreciate this arc more than I already did, man. So much greatness. So much awesome sauce. And I, I can't wait. I can't wait to see more of my boy Jing, man, of course. Can't wait to see what's going to happen with the dynamic of him and Periston. Uh, beyond and what's he, what he's about to do here in the Dark Continent. What will they see? What will they meet um, here, in, here whenever they get there? Dawn Freaks, man. Cool. This entire storyline between the princes, it's all intertwining, bro. The true Tropica, Hisoka, the princess, man. And you're like, yo, what's gonna happen on this boat? So, so many different and interesting scenarios, man. But I'll tell you guys this, man. I, 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 I could not possibly be more excited as a Hunter Hunter fan of the fact that it's coming back now. Because we're 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 on the boat, man. We're on there. So something's gonna happen, right? Something's gonna happen in this in this in this in this Togashi return in this volume. Because I believe that he'll be here for a, at the very least, hopefully, a, a volume worth of content. And if he's here for volumes worth of content, we're gonna we're gonna receive something, guys. We didn't expect Hisoka versus Crow last time, man. But now with everything, with a sacred beast ritual. The princes are about to go at each other. They're gonna find. I mean, just with the the bodyguard scenario by itself, really made me think like this. This is gonna be just like uh, insane. If the bodyguards within their own squad, within one squad, just Prince, just Prince Wobbles, just Prince Wobbles. If the bodyguards within one own squad are having this much conversations and conflicts with one another on how they can't trust each other, imagine I was gonna be on the whole damn ship. Imagine how it's gonna be on the whole ship, and you have civilians down there on um, things three to five. Apparently, apparently, this whole succession war is gonna take place on levels one through one through two. But when you have people like the troop on here, and and savages, this thing's gonna take up the whole boat, bro. It has to. Then you have everyone else's on here too, bro, and you're just like, bro. But I, 
couldn't be more excited as a Hunter Hunter fan, man. I truly can. I, I truly cannot, man. I can't wait for tomorrow, but let me know what you guys have loved about the Dark Continent arc thus far, and what you're excited for, and what you can't wait to see, man. I'd love to read your guys' comments, because it's Hunter Hunter, it's the GOAT, and it's awesome sauce, man. What is gonna happen here in the next couple of things, man? I, like I said, it's crazy, and Togashi gets to get in so many different routes, man, that I, you can't predict it. You can't predict it, but I will see you guys later. Who will survive? We'll find out, man. We'll find out. Thank you all so much for watching. Hunter Hunter Greatness.